today's readings present us with a reality of fear. Who the victim of fear is and who the victor victim could be. You recall last Sunday, there were two parables within the reading we took from Mark, just Gospel chapter 4. I'm more interested in the first parable, which was of a man going out, throwing seeds, and he goes to sleep. He wakes from sleep. He does not know how the seed germinates. All he does is that he's able to harvest what he does, harvest the produce from the seeds. So for him, what is important is the harvest. But between the moment when those seeds were scattered and the period of harvest was a period of darkness, a period of uncertainty, a period we know not how. That period is essential. Last Sunday, you realized who was responsible for that period. The farmer does not know. You don't know. I don't know. But he knows. He is God. He gives growth. There's the reason why 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 6, when Paul would say, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the growth. And if you also read Matthew's gospel, chapter 9, verse 37, you realize Jesus is saying, the harvest is rich, but the laborers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest to give laborers. Who is the Lord of the harvest? The same God. Today's reading helps us to enter the reality of the one who is greater than all forms of storms in our lives in the world, both physical and spiritual evils. And the first reading, taken from Job chapter 38, clearly indicates the situation. But for us to understand what is happening in chapter 38, we need to go back. Recall, in Job, Job chapter 1, precisely around verse 6 following, God permits Satan to put Job under serious trial. Why would God permit Satan? First of all, he says, he got into a conversation with Satan. Have you not noticed my servant? So then Satan will say to God, you've given him so much protection, and he's doing that. He fears you. He's, a, an, he's an honest man. He's a righteous man because of what you have given him. His possessions, what he has. But that was a lie. Satan is a liar. That was a lie. So God said, it is not true. What you are saying, what you are thinking is not correct. The truth is, Job is upright and he fears God because of who he is. Not what he has. Or not his possessions. Having permitted Satan, he goes on dealing with Job, taking away his possessions, not those possessions he bought, he, he acquired, whether through inheritance or no, or not, but even his family, his children. Some around chapter 2, his wife would even say to him, why don't you curse God and die? It is better for you to die than to be in this very sorry state. Now, my dear brothers and sisters in Christ, has your spouse said that to you before? That it's better for you to die? Has any of your children said that to you? Or have you said that to your children? It is being said now. Listen, it is being said now. Someone is saying that now. But no. 
Job will not curse God. And around chapter 23, the trials, the torment, the, the problem of Job goes, not just from his feet, gets to his throat. Now he's suffocating. He speaks out. Like Job, we get to a point, a, almost a breaking point, where we say, Lord, what is this? What is happening to, to me? What is happening to us? It is human to ask like Job. And Job will want God to give him a reason. Job was an honest man. He obeyed the commandments. Like you, you he, attended, he went to Mass every, every Sunday. There was no Sunday he didn't go to church. In fact, Job went to Mass every day. Or Job goes to Mass every day, comes to Mass every day. He prays every day. Job contributes to APA, does not delay, writes a check very quickly. Job supports all charities. Job takes all occasion to teach his children and even offers sacrifice, ensure they go to receive the sacrament of reconciliation in case they have sinned. Please go. You need reconciliation. I don't want you to die in sin. That is Job. And once he raises the question, God would allow the passage of time. In chapter 38, which is God giving answer to Job, our reading is extracted. Part of it is taken as our first reading today. But it doesn't stop here. If you go to chapter 40, Job would say, I have spoken once, I will not speak again. And if in chapter 42, he would say, I repent of having thought that I was right and you were wrong. In my life, I have prayed like Job. My journey to the priesthood, after my, my, my college, computer, I studied computer engineering. After my college, I worked for about seven years in the industry before I got into the seminary. And when I went to the seminary, I had high expectations. I assumed that the seminary was supposed to be a place where angels were to come and become priests, but I was disappointed. What was my scandal? The scandal was not that somebody did. It was just the case that I saw two brothers not being able to be, to be brothers. Two future priests not being able to be, to be brothers in the priesthood. I was afraid. Was I going to be like that? Was I going to be a priest where I cannot have that love with a brother priest? Was I going to be like that? I was afraid and I broke down. I went to Jesus in the blessed sacrament. I knelt before him. I said to him, Lord, why have you deceived me? Why did you make me come this far? I was very upset. Jesus knows I was very upset. He knows very well. And I poured out my bitterness to him. But you know what? I didn't walk away. That period, I'm sure I fell into a trance. It was a case that for about one minute or two minutes. What happened to me was, he revealed to me those occasions from my childhood to the, that moment where I was kneeling, how he had been present. All I kept hearing was, who was there for you? Who was there? He shows me the picture, the flashback, who was there, who was there, who was there, who was there? And this happened in such a quick succession that could not have been processed by me. I had not, not that ability to process it. Then I broke down and said, I am sorry, Lord. I thought you deceived me. I thought you abandoned me. We all have, since that moment when I got to know that he was not far from me, it has never happened again. It is not going to happen again. Because God does not change. God is God. Even when the storm is breaking, 
the ship, the boat, is, it's tearing us apart. God is God. As we may recall, see in Job chapter 42, it says, God may be teaching me something. Recall that in the beginning of this conversation between Satan and God, Job was not consulted. Job was not asked to witness to their discussion. So Job was unaware. So you may have to be unaware of the difficulty you're passing through. You, you, you're trying to look for the source. You don't have any idea about the sources of your troubles. Stop trying to find them. Where God is God. Dear friends in Christ, in the gospel reading today, Jesus is in the boat with his head maybe resting on a, on a soft cushion. You know what it is to be on a very nice cushion. I don't want to advertise any product, but some, some pillows are really very good, you know. When you put such, if you're having difficulty with sleeping, check the kind of bed you sleep on, the pillow that's underneath your head, and you may get a difference. Dear friends in Christ, Jesus was asleep. But he was in the boat. In the entire scripture, particularly in the Old Testament, only God had power over nature. If we read Psalm 89 verse 9, his power over the waves is there. And this, the responsorial psalm is taken from Psalm 107. Precisely from verse 28, verse 28 and 20, 29, are echoing the power of God over all storms. Uh, the invitation is for us to have faith. The invitation is to be committed in faith. That you have faith doesn't eradicate the source of fear. That we have faith does not mean that the source of fear will be taken off. But having faith enables us to, to deal with those sources of fear and anxiety. And it changes the whole narrative. It takes us from being victims of fear to become victim victors. Why it, we are not just victors? Because we are not God ourselves. Fear will still come. It will not stop now. You will still have occasion to fear. So you, you still remain vulnerable. Know your limitations. Let us know our limitations. And always call on God, who is above every form of storm in our lives. Today, you may ask, what fears do we really have around us? The death of a loved one, as was in the case of Job, his children. The absence of fathers in families could be another fear. And the fathers who are present are afraid. Fatherhood is becoming something too expensive to get in. Those who are taking the courage, please, fathers, be strong. Don't be afraid. Trust in God. You may not be perfect. You may not be what you want to be right now. One more step. The ship you want to cruise on should be the ship where Jesus is on board. Don't cruise on the ship where you think Jesus is Jonah. As we read in Jonah chapter 1. Because Jonah, the case of Jonah was Jonah had to be thrown into the sea. He was thrown out because he was a disturbance on, on board. Jesus is not Jonah. Jesus is greater than Jonah. He is not to be thrown off board. He, he comes to hear. They wake him and say, do you not care? And one would think, don't you realize he's master and you use that language to say he doesn't, don't you care? You cannot care as much as Jesus for yourselves. Jesus cares for 
you more than you care for yourself. Yes. Let Jesus be on board. Through prayer. Through sacrifice. Through service. Through empathy. Within the family. Be able to understand. Giving people benefit of the doubt changes the narrative. It is our prayer that God, who is almighty, may calm the storms in our lives, even when we still have to cruise on the sea, because the sea is the symbol of the world. The boat, the symbol of the church, and by extension, the church being, the family being a domestic church, by extension, the family. And once Jesus is on board, all fear is gone. Even when it waves, even when it is turbulent, may God strengthen us, strengthen our faith. Amen?